welcome friends to this afternoon session of our monthly meeting i was uh, talking to a friend of mine now and he raised a point which i thought i should share with you the point he raised was that some people come who have been initiated by masters and they have great love and devotion for their master and they meditate according to the instructions of that master master passes away dies in his physical body they have not yet established the radiant form of a master they go to a, another person who becomes the new master the conflict comes should we follow the new master because that will be betrayal it's like having an extra marital affair <laughs> they think like that that we were married to a master almost like we were so close and we pledged our loyalty to that master and now suddenly we are going to somebody else it's a big conflict and i know people have that conflict and they have for years sometimes so that conflict comes as a very big obstacle in meditation because you're getting help neither from one or the other <laughs> that you want to get the progress the love and devotion for the master who first initiates you and suddenly the thought of the one who is alive now comes up it's a, it's a it's a big shift you run between one and the other in that conflict and you can neither love the first nor the second because just because of the conflict how do we resolve that conflict only the truth will tell you how to resolve the conflict and the truth is there is only one self the truth is that one whom we call a perfect living master is not operating from any other level except at the level of oneness therefore there are 5 10 20 perfect living masters they all speaking from the one truth the one self from spiritual point of view they are all one we distinguish them because we see their outer form only but they do not function from the outer form when we feel we get the feeling we get love from a perfect living master we see his physical face physical body physical appearance here and we take baby all he saying is as the human being is not at all teachers can do that masters who have learned something and teach can do that but these perfect living masters don't come either to learn or to teach they come to connect us to the one truth which is theirs truth and yours and every other master only one and that is why the truth is that perfect living masters are all one and that, and that resolves the issue in your mind if you are able to think of it there is also that other issue came up during discussion about the role of the human mind in creating and resolving a conflict because when we say am i loyal to this person or that person how are we saying it on the advice of our mind the mind is advising us because mind holds the moral code the mind holds the all codes of conduct how you should conduct yourself and the mind says oh that's betrayal oh that's not good and then the conflict becomes your conflict and mind creates so many other conflicts too every day so how do we resolve these conflicts of the mind we can resolve the conflicts of the mind by talking to the mind we don't talk enough to the mind we talk to other people we should start talking to the mind and use the mind for talking because nothing else can talk in you except the mind all thinking is done by the mind and even when you are talking to each other talking to people you are using the mind for speaking i have said repeatedly the soul is a listener the mind is a speaker soul does not speak soul never speaks soul uses the mind to speak mind has been given to the soul so soul can use it if you want to speak if you want to write if you want to do anything we use the mind to do all these things but when we make the mind more important than ourselves when we begin to beg for advice from the mind 
mind says, I am the master, I am independent from you. And we begin to accept that. We begin to accept that the mind knows everything, we know nothing, we have to check with the mind, what should we do? That's the problem. We have suppressed our spiritual will and allowed ourselves to go with mental will. Now, what are those two wills then? What's a spiritual will and what's a mental will? A mental will comes from thought. You think out, this is what I should do. That's a mental will. But spiritual will is which comes intuitively, spontaneously. This is to be done. No thinking. That's spiritual will. When the mental will is trying to control us and we have built our spiritual will, to put that spiritual will into words, we still use the mind to speak. But we use the spiritual will which is going against the mental advice to us and tell the mind using it, don't do it. Or we have other means too. Because mind always thinks in language, in words. Or sometimes in images. But the images it makes, faces, things, places inside the mind is also made up with words. As I expressed in the morning, the words of language create a sense or meaning of things that we see. So when that happens and you want to use the mind against the mind, you have to use spiritual will and not mental will. Mental will will take you to circle of thinking all over again and again and not come to any conclusion. That's one of the natures of the mind. To, con to go on thinking, go on thinking, ultimately you come to a point, you start thinking again, no conclusion. One question leads to another question. One doubt leads to another doubt. That's how it works. But if your spiritual will is strong, you can stop this nonsense of the mind. Say, stop it. You can use the mind to utter these words. Stop it. Now, when I say you can use it, I am not saying that the advisory mind should tell you to use it. When you use it, what makes the expression that you use it is called intuition, spontaneity, suddenness, oneness. That spontaneity, intuition is the language of the soul and you can't uh, uh, speak it out, you can't understand it without use of the mind for it. But still, it is independent. That is why we distinguish so much between the role of the mind and the role of spiritual will, between mental will and spiritual will. If something comes to you intuitively, remember, intuitively means not in time, then it's the soul giving a message. If something is thought out and you consider it and deliberate upon it and then come to it, it's mental. All of us have spiritual will existing in us and expressing itself every day. We don't call it the spiritual will, we call it gut feeling. It's just a feeling inside. This should be like that, this is like that. And no reason, no mental thought, we have a gut feeling. That's the voice of your spirit, of your soul. Make that voice the primary thing and talk out to the mind consistent with that voice of intuition. You can control the mind. Of course, if the mind still speaks in your head, then force those words out by putting new words of your choice, not mind's choice. Masters initiate us and they give us few words to repeat calling them Simran, Mantra, something. Wonderful words, because those words we can, with our spiritual will, put into our head. And if you put the words into your head, they are taking away the space that other thoughts were taking. The Simran, or the repetition of words, has a very important function of squeezing out words of thought making more space for intuition to function. Because those words repeat and they repeat and you can make them a mental continuous repetition. That means you can become a habitual repeater of those words. Supposing you do that, then do you know when you use those words, when you put attention on them? Words are going on like other thoughts because you've been repeating them all the time, several hours a day. And then they become a habit of the mind. And then they're habitually speaking, you are sleeping, you wake up, they're still moving, 
But you are thinking of other things with the rest of your mind. When you put attention on those words, more of your mind gets occupied with them and cannot think other things. That is why I have said again and again that the repetition of any mantra, any words, in order to take care of the mind, to make it think less, ultimately be under your control, repetition must be with your full attention on listening to those words. The soul's attention comes through listening. You repeat the words, listen to them. Repeat slowly. If you repeat too fast, you can't listen. It just goes by. Your mind has a chance to think of other things. At the same time, you are thinking, you are doing similar. If you listen to it with attention, attentively, you grab the attention inside the listening of the words and the words squeeze out the thoughts. At that stage, when your mind is weak because it is not thinking that much because you put these words, that's the time to put your gut feeling into practice. No, tell the mind no. And it works. If you keep on practicing this, in a few months, you'll find you are the master of your mind. Mind will think what you want it to think. Not that it keeps on thinking and tells you what to do. Mind was never given to us to be a guide or a master or advisor. Mind was given to us so we could think, speak, communicate, understand, read books. It was given for a specific purpose, for our own help. But we allow the mind to run, run amok because we don't control it. There is no way to control a mind by saying, I will stop thinking because nobody can stop thinking. Thinking is a continuous process. Thinking is the heartbeat of the mind. If we stop thinking, it will die, then our body and everything will die. To keep the mind active, it must think. You should make it think even more. Make full use of it. Think of the master. Think of the words of mantra. Try to remember things through the mind. Memories are all stored in the mind. Remember when you last met the master. Remember what he said to you. It's, it's important that we understand the role of Simran, and the ultimate objective is to have the mind under our own control and the spiritual will dictates to the mind what it should do at any time, day and night. There's also one other question that came up today and that is about a part of the technique of meditation called Dhyan. The techniques or the method of meditation that I follow on the teachings of great master Hadun Maharaj Baba Sravan Singh require that we apply the following three things for our meditation. One, to seat ourselves at the third eye center behind the eyes. That's step number one, most essential step. If we don't do that and we go about our business and say we are repeating the words, no value. I must tell you. Maybe having some value indirectly in how your mind thinks, how your mind works, but not in meditation. To meditate effectively, the first part is, and should be done first, to close your eyes and sit behind the eyes. Not that you, I am saying, now sit, see, just find out that you are sitting behind the eyes. You are already there. Just become aware of it. Become aware of the fact, and when you become aware that you are sitting in the head behind the eyes, automatically the body becomes a, a covering upon you. You can call it. You can call it a vehicle that you're driving from there. Call it a house in which you live in the sixth floor. Call it by any names. It's an outside things around, around you. First step. If you don't do this step, forget about meditation. According to the system taught to me. A lot of people, I find, my friends, I find meditating without doing this. They think you can roam around in the world, think of everything and then start doing mechanical meditation mantra repeating. Maybe it makes you feel good. It doesn't lead you to your spiritual true home. Therefore, to make meditation effective, you should do the first step. Second step, repetition of words. Words you will repeat are to squeeze out the words of thought, make more place for yourself and your spirit identity, not the mental identity behind the eyes from where you operate. The third part is called dhyan, contemplation of the face of the master. 
to do dhyan on it. It's in dhyan that the other conflict I spoke to you about, who is your real master, the one who initiated you first and then you could not have more time with him, or the one who is alive now and whose face you can see today, conflict will come at the time of dhyan. Whose face do we imagine? Whose face do we visualize? And many people are stuck with that. They are stuck who and they can neither do one nor the other. It reminds me of the story of a donkey who could not decide whether he should have hay or grass. He would look at grass, no hay, hay, no grass. He died of starvation. <laughs> <laughs> we do the same thing in this conflict. No. Remember they are all the same. And do not distinguish. See where they come from. And see that if you are meditating with intention on the words inside, which means you are well seated inside, more and more of your awareness has been withdrawn from the body and come into where you are sitting. At that time, master face will come by itself because you are thinking of it. But dhyan, as properly understood, does not mean that you make a picture of a master's face or take a photograph and concentrate on it and then see the picture again. That's not dhyan. Dhyan is not on a static thing. Dhyan is on a living person. Dhyan is on an actual living master, a perfect living master. And if the living master is not there in front of you in meditation, it's not proper dhyan. Now, how do you get the dhyan of a living person First thing is, don't make it up. Anything you make up is just your own imagination and is being created mostly from seeing videos, seeing pictures, remembering something, being told by somebody. That's not dhyan. True dhyan is when you actually remember the living being that you saw, actually remembering the face of a master as you saw, and remembering the Words master spoke, what he said, how he walked, where was he, where was he sitting. It's a memory. Proper dhyan is a memory of the master. Therefore, it has to be a living experience of a living person that you bring back into memory. Anything short of that is not the best use of dhyan. That is why people get stuck on these things. And they make their own images and think they are having dhyan of a master. That is why it's 100% necessary that you have an interaction with a living person in your own lifetime which you can remember. That is why you can never do dhyan of a master who is dead. You can never do dhyan of a master who says he initiated you from a distance and you have never seen his face. These are so essential. And we keep on emphasizing the need of a perfect living master and we forget that these are essential things to have the dhyan of a perfect living master. That is why when you remember the master, any event, even if it happened 20 years ago, even if it happened 40 years ago, but you can recall the memory of that experience, it's proper dhyan. These three things work in unison with each other. Finally, what it leads on to is the real Simran, which you don't have to do. Real Simran is not in words, but in non-phonetic sounds. It can be heard as a sound, musical sound, sounds of bells, sounds of musical instruments, sounds of flutes, beautiful sounds, several sounds in combination. What are these sounds? The sounds enable you to meditate without doing Simran yourself. Simran is also sound. You also put attention on the words when you speak, then only it becomes effective. And here you don't have to put either repeat words or put attention. The sound comes up and you can switch the attention to the sound. But it must be sound coming from within yourself. It must be sound from your true home. Not a created sound from outside. Outside sound will have no effect. People have 
asked me, can we put up a nice light music and listen to them? Will it work like the inner sound? No. Inner sound is representing your consciousness in an audible way. Imagine, we couldn't define consciousness. It's a potential for awareness. And here, it's manifesting in several forms, including the whole creation plus an audible sound that can be heard in meditation by any one of us. That is why this combination works together. But we, with our attention, can switch between one and the other. We can switch between remembering the Master. We can switch between memory coming and the Master is really there. We can switch between repeating the words. We can switch between listening to sound. We can sometimes just relax and let all the things happen together. Best meditation. Best meditation is when you're trying for nothing, but these things are happening in you. When do they happen? When does it happen that something is coming automatically without your trying? I'll tell you when that happens. You all know it. When you love, love somebody, that person's face comes automatically without your trying. That's exactly what meditation is here. Then you can love somebody, experience the love of somebody, get so attached, so much in love with a person, that comes automatically all the time. There's another expression which we use for that, I miss you very much. Have you heard that? Where does that come from? From love. When you miss your master, dhyan becomes automatic, similar becomes automatic, sound becomes automatic, they all become automatic. Single one medicine covers all diseases. It's like that. Somebody had invented in India a medicine and called it the nine jewels. He called named it the Navrata Kalp. And he was a very wise man, Ayurvedic guy, and he produced an Ayurvedic remedy called Navratan Kalp, the combination of nine jewels. The jewels were references to minerals and so much, which he do, used in that medicine. He made it all comprehensive. So, you are sick, take the medicine. One of my friends went to him and he said, I understand you are a very well-known Ayurvedic uh, practitioner. I want you to listen to me. He listened for one hour. The doctor gave him one hour's time to listen to everything. Then he said, I have the remedy for you. Navratal Kalp. I found he gave the same remedy to everybody. I asked him, I met that doctor once, he was in, in Punjab, and I said, how come if you have to give the same remedy, you spend an hour listening to the person? He said, the remedy does only 10% work. My listening does the remaining 90%. <laughs> if we don't listen, nothing is coming out, it's all suppressed. So, the real healers give a lot more time to you to express what is bothering you and then they give you sometimes not nine, ju nine jewels in that medicine. They give you, if they are uh, sadhu healers in India, they'll give you little ash. Little ash is babuti. It's holy ash. Just take it. Tip of the tongue. Put in your, put in your forehead. Illness is gone. Because it was now doing less than 10%. The rest of it was done by your explaining all your problem. Therefore, when you experience the love of a perfect living master, it is better than Navra than Kalp. It includes everything. And other things that we are teaching, trying to do, they come automatically. It becomes so easy. So secret is the love. And that does not appear in our life if you have never even met the person. Or if we have totally forgotten there is no contact with the master. People having a living master, if they don't go to see him, they are missing out something. Their mind takes hold and mind starts making master saying this, master saying this, now master saying this, I am following the master. No, you are following the mind. Go to the master and say, my mind said these things. Did you say that? He said, of course not. I wasn't even there. It's your mind speaking to you. Therefore, so important to be able to see that human being who is a perfect living master can express so much of unconditional love that touches you and your unconditional love flows 
out and inside and pulls you from inside. How important it is to have darshan. Darshan is very important. And what is darshan? Seeing the master, looking at his face. You look at his face with the love that he expresses. You close your eyes, go and meditate. His face will come by itself, not by your effort. And dhyan will take place automatically. How often should you see a master? I think I mentioned once earlier in one of my talks that a person who had come from overseas and was talking to great master, my master, Lul Maharaj Baba Saman Singh, he said, Master, we would all like to be with you. How often should we come to see you? Is it enough that we have seen you, got initiated, now we'll go back home and we'll meditate and get everything? Master said, no. You should see the master for his darshan. And even more important, for his drishti. The difference between darshan and drishti is, darshan is just looking at the master. Drishti is when the master looks at you with attention. It's even more valuable. One drishti you can carry with us, it lasts a long time. But how long? So the, that guy asked the master, how often should we meet you? He said, the best, best answer would be every day. So, said, master, if we are not living with you, not living in the same town, we have to come from outside. He said, in that case, once a week is fine. Now on that answer, my grandfather, who became a, master, a disciple of great master much later after my father, but he was a very devoted master. When he heard that, he, for the rest of his life, went to see great master every week, once a week. Then that person said, but what if a person is living very far away and cannot afford even to travel? Master said, then in that case, even one month a visit to a master is good enough. Then he said, Master, what about people living overseas who have to really spend a lot of money to come and don't even have the time, they are all busy. How often should they come? Great master said, for such people who are so far away, once a year is good enough. And that guy said, Master, supposing one cannot come once a year. Master smiled. He said, they can wait for their next life. Yeah. This is from master's point of view. One life is not the whole time frame available. There are so many lives. Of course, they try to restrict time available to a, to a disciple of a perfect living master to know more than four lives. They work within a small frame of four lifetimes. Nobody initiated by a perfect living master can ever have more than four human lifetimes. But if you can't even see a master in a physical form, then naturally you need more time. Maybe two lifetimes, one, three, four. But the point here is, can we really afford to go and see a master that often that the great master recommended? My answer is yes. It only needs a revision of our priorities in spending money. We spend money on so many things which we think are very important, very gratifying. Visit to master, come at some lower priority. Put it on top, you'll always be able to go to the master. It's our priorities. Similarly, when we are talking of how much time we should give to master, how much time to meditation, Oh, we, master said two and a half hours. That's very difficult. We don't have, we don't have time. We're so busy. Two and a half hours, we can't find one hour. We can't find half an hour. How can we find two and a half hours in meditation? Somebody had asked that question also to great master. Master, how long should really our meditation be? Is two and a half hours necessary? Master said, nothing is necessary. Because it's a matter of quality of meditation, not the quantity. If you meditate with that intense love and devotion for your master five minutes, it's better than six hours of meditation constantly looking at the watch, is six hours over or not. It's the quality. But if we take the quality out of the equation, then how much meditation we should do? The desirable is about 21 and a half hours out of every 24. Master, we are thinking that we can't even do two and a half. You are saying twenty-one and a half hours. How can that be? He says, you don't have to meditate the same way. 
you can meditate in many ways. For example, you can think of the master, that's meditation. And I, uh, he said, I'll give you another tip. When you say you are busy with your work, and when you're free, you have to think of the master, why don't you think you're doing work for the master? It's meditation. What if you start believing master is doing it through you? It's even high quality meditation. Which means you don't have to find any special time for meditation. You meditate all the time when you're associating your work with your master. But master, we need sleep. How about sleep? We can't be meditating. We are sleeping. Master said, no. Meditate formally with repetition of words, Simran, for half an hour before you go to sleep. Repeat the words. Mostly Simran at that time. Repeat the words and in the morning when you get up, you are meditating still. If you by chance happen to get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom or for some other errand, in the middle of the night, you will find your mind is still doing meditation. Repeating words. If you meditate before going to sleep, the whole night can become, whole sleeping night can become meditation. The mind picks it up. Therefore, the master said, if you follow the system, all the time master is in your mind, you are meditating all the time, he is just giving an allowance for two and a half hours to do other work which are of such serious, uh, serious nature that the in intensity of your attention is required there. Only that two and a half hours is exempting for work. The rest is all meditation, twenty-one and a half hours. Great master said, if you take a balance and put weights on both sides, whichever is heavy, you take the balance down. If you put 21 and a half hours into worldly activities, worldly thoughts, worldly attachments, and then put two and a half hours in meditation, meditation is very light. The world will keep you here. But if you reverse it, you will make good progress. That is why, do not think that meditation means sitting in a particular position, position doing asanas, closing your eyes and ears. No, meditation is to meditate upon the master. To meditate means to think about it, to keep it in your mind. So when we think constantly, everything happening, the master sometimes facilitates also because some unusual miracles, coincidences happen in our life. We look at that, must be master doing it. It's a way he's creating meditation for you automatically. And as you know, when we follow this path, more and more coincidences take place. Every time we remember master, you're meditating. Don't make meditation into a cultish kind of activity. Oh, unless you do this asana, unless you sit like this. Some people came to me and said, you know, you are not encouraging the proper kind of meditation. I said, which is the proper kind? The proper kind is, they sit on, on the ground and you put your uh, elbows on this and try to hear the sound inside. I said, demonstrate to me. He tried to demonstrate, he fell. <laughs> I said, that's so difficult. You who are practicing that can't do it, and you're asking me to do it. I'll fail. But are you associating, discovering yourself within, having experience of love of a human being who is who is the totality in uh, human form, are you telling me that to bending your knees and trying to put your elbows on the knees is equivalent to that? Is this going to lead you there? Why did he say that? Because I also got an initiation and sat like that guy when I got initiation for a very simple reason. We are poor. We are poor country. We didn't have anything to sit on. And this was easy. Everybody could do it. The poorest man could do it. It was made for everybody, including the poorest people who can afford nothing. They still afford their body and can sit like that. And why sit like that? To be able to hear the sound inside the head. And why not just sit straight on the ground and hear? Because the elbows get tired. They don't have any chairs with arms on which you can put the elbows. They didn't even have the wooden tea, which they called ragan. Only rich people could afford it. Here's a system 
of listening to sound prescribed and suggested so that without furniture without external aid we can for longer period put our elbows comfortably on the knees and listen and now you make that as the secret of discovery of course not that's what we do an external thing that we just helpful at that time in that place you think is meditation meditation is to meditate upon the truth and the truth available to us is the perfect living master who is a human form of that very truth which is only one so lucky that we have such people who can appear as human beings and carry with them the awareness of totality that's the only difference between a perfect living master and ourselves we are built the same way we are human beings our anatomy is the same our karma is the same our mind is the same our thinking is the same there's no difference except one a perfect living master when he is here with us in the wakeful state in which we are wakeful state he is aware actually aware at that time of all levels of creation including our true home which is only one he is constantly aware of the way the show has been set up and in the show he knows the script of the show he made it you made it too but only in the state of oneness the script of the show required at a certain time in this journey of experience you will get tired of the journey want to go back home you forgotten because of the attachment to the to the show outside at that very time the master will appear in your life take you back home perfect living master do not come to teach us anything they come to take us back home and once they say you are my friend we'll go together to our true home your job their job is done and guru granth sahib it says if you just just whoever has seen the face of a master his journey is over his account is over this ka lekha nibdya one darshan cancel your whole journey is over now it's a matter of a little bit time processing of that as it were in a few lifetimes and processing in a very convenient comfortable way so that the severity of bad karmas severity of the suffering we might suffer because of this law of karma and law of cause and effect becomes less and manageable masters participate participate with us even as human beings we complain master this too too much pain i can't take it whether physical or emotional or mental i can't take this pain they don't say oh this is just a show forget about the pain they can see our pain they take some of that pain on themselves they can get sick more sick for the sake of people whom they are helping as human beings masters are full of such love and compassion they no equal to that they are continuously drawing they are continuously surrounded by pure love because that is our state in our true home as they bring that true home to us here in a physical experience there is no way i can describe what a perfect living master is a perfect living master is the creator is the creation the totality everything put together in a human body and brought in our life how can you how can you explain and describe such a thing how can you describe such a phenomenon and yet it is there and verifiable for those who are banking so much on their minds power of analysis power of uh, considering with doubts and skepticism okay use the same mind remove your doubts and skepticism try it out it's practical it does not involve any blind faith he does not say it's not religion religion requires you to have blind faith blind faith is essential ingredient of religion is written in the book you have to follow have to believe but i don't have the experience the book says still book book is more right than your experience than religion and what is the spirituality spirituality is, go with your experience forget the books see what your experience is then read the book it will make sense to you if you read the book with your mind your mental interpretation it won't work but first have the experience then read the book it will make sense 
So it's, that's the difference. But we are caught up in religion. We are caught up so much into religion. We are brainwashed by religion. We can't think properly. I remember my one of my sisters remembered her past life. And it, it was verified by our discovering her past parents where they lived by strange coincidences. And there was a, a Muslim doctor next to a house, a neighbor, who said, I don't believe in reincarnation at all. My religion doesn't permit me to believe that. He said, you come and investigate this case yourself. Look what she's saying at this age of three years old, just speaking words. She's mentioning names. And those names have led us to discover that guy, her old sisters and brothers are living there. The doctor went and investigated. He said the evidence is overwhelming that this girl remembers her past life. But my religion does not permit, I can't believe it. In the MD, educated man, highly educated man, thinking every day how to handle things, how to handle patients, how to handle sickness. Religion will not, will not let him believe or accept something that has all the evidence in front of him. Religion is such a... It's, it's, people take intoxication and forget other things. Religion makes you forget reality. Religion makes you stick to rules, rules, regulations. Follow this. Otherwise, go to an undefined hell. You are condemned. What about uh, uh, how many gods are there? Every religion claims to have a god. That's essential. To make it theistic religion, you have to have a the theistic part, which means God has to be present. Give him different names. God, Allah, Ishwar, Parmeshwar, Zeus, whatever you want to call him. Names don't matter. Everybody accepts in the religion. There is a God. And we have to worship him. Somehow, he controls everything. But maybe he doesn't control the terrorists who are attacking people. <laughs> maybe they, all the uh, assassinations going on in the world all the sins that are going in the world, horrible things. God must be very angry. What is he doing? Is he really a creator? A person can have this question. And you can go to one of the priests and ask him, you say that one God is all love and kindness. You tell us God will take care of you. Why are these things happening then? Why is he not taking care of us? You go and tell the person, whoever is speaking on behalf of God in the temple, church, mosque, wherever, go and ask him this question. Answer is, you're not supposed to ask these questions. No, no, you can't doubt God. You can't ask questions about God. Then what are we worshipping then? Who are we worshipping? We can't, I've been asked questions. And if you ask questions, answer in the book. Read the book, the scripture. You read, you'll find the answer. Okay, I go and read the scripture. Scripture says, God is within yourself. Scripture says, every scripture says, God is within yourself. So I go to the same priest. I, you told me to read the scripture answer. I found the answer. God is in me, not here in the church, in the, in the temple, in the mosque. It's not here. Don't talk like that. This is the house of God. House of worship. You better stick here. And you are, if you keep on doing what you're doing, you're condemned to hell. Blasphemy what you're talking to me. Do you know I've heard these things in all religions? Where are we going? Is this spirituality? And all religions. Look back on the founders of those religions. They were spiritual masters. They all said the truth is within you. This body is the temple of a living God, not a dead God. All, if, if we say God created everything and he forgets about what torture is going on, what terrorism is going on, what sickness is going on, what insanity is going on, maybe he's gone to sleep or he's dead. We don't know what's happened to God. But when they say, the scriptures say the God is within you and is alive and kicking, and go in and find out. This is the real temple. We don't go to the right temple. We don't go to the right mosque, right church. 
we go to man made buildings buildings made by human beings scriptures printed in our press and they become holy books and are sometimes worshiped we are printing god in a press you imagine how much dishonesty we are doing to our own self by not even following the basic teachings of all religion and saying the do's and don'ts are more important than the discovery of the truth within yourself that is why these are the conflicts that the mind is creating and there is only one solution go as beggars at the door of god who is available in human form human form a visible form of god the perfect living master telling you that experience comes when you find that the person you are thinking was ordinary becomes extraordinary as you go and know more and more more and more eventually you find this was the very destination you're looking for you go to a perfect living master to get instructions how to find god when you go to god to find instructions how to find him you will later on find that the embodiment of totality of consciousness which we call god is sitting right with us in this physical world and we are going around looking somewhere else but we can't see it therefore such a person perfect living master makes us see the truth of this and that's the beauty of the spiritual game which we call meditation and true worship i hope we will all follow the direction that will lead us to truth ultimate truth ultimate reality direction is inwards not outwards always go inwards go within you get all the answers thank you very much for joining me again today this month and we will continue to have these monthly meetings except when i am out of town or out of the country for a whole month then we will make an announcement for that and uh, i am very happy we have prashad yes. now now uh, we will distribute we have start, restarted the tradition of giving prashad at, on these meetings prashad i want to explain again if i haven't uh, said it too many times already is blessed food it's just a tradition it was in the great master's time it's a, a very common tradition in any place of spirituality or worship they talk of prashad as a blessed something blessed actually it need not be food but the mind likes food i think we all love food so the master that sometime decided give them what they like otherwise even if you are able to get the flower from a master it's as equally good prashad if master has visited you and sat on your table the table is prashad no different from the prashad you going to get now prashad means something associated with the master when you look at it when you taste it when you use it it reminds you of master that's prashad that's the meaning of blessing of prashad so prashad does not mean necessarily particular kind of food that has been transformed into something else it's ordinary things they'll give puffed rice puffed rice it's the same rice you buy at the store little puffed <laughs> you know <laughs> that doesn't make it different i can assure you there is no molecular change in the regular puffed rice and the prashad puffed rice but the regular puffed rice you can eat all your life and not get the benefit which you can get with one piece taken from the blessed prashad regular puffed rice does not connect you with the master the blessed puffed rice connects you with the master every time you look at it every time you use it. that's what the blessing means the blessing associates the master with what he's giving so that is why i am invoking the blessings of my master great master whom you may not be able to see at this time in that form in which he existed but i can and therefore when i seek his blessings he blesses as if he was still here alive and blessed it that is why even i hide a little of the prashad blessed i have for myself <laughs> and there is a girl sitting here who keeps quietly hidden from others also so that i maintain my privacy with my master through prashad prashad is very personal thing is something that you taking remembering your master is prashad 
is a basis of the highest love affair you can have. Because you take it, you remember your beloved. And a beloved who is a beloved forever. Difficult to find in this world. Difficult to find a friend who is a friend forever. Ever means beyond this life. And at no time breaking from that friendship. Not today we make up, tomorrow we break up. Not like that. Not like worldly friendship. The friendship with a perfect heavy master is totally different things. It's a link that never breaks and stays with us. And more we enjoy the link, more we recall the link, everything around us changes, including the whole world. People say, things have changed since I got this. Things are changing because of the link. The link is with that which created the universe. It can change. It can modify. It can do anything. And that link is what is responsible for our spiritual growth and our spiritual realization of our own self. All this, all this information, all this jump-starting of our spiritual journey can come single piece taken from a bag of prashad. So that's why don't take prashad lightly. On the other hand, don't use it to cure fever or rheumatic pains or arthritis. No, no, take Tylenol. <laughs> Add something. Okay? Well, thank you very much for joining. We'll give Prashad then. I'll have some personal interviews with people who have been uh, waiting and those who are newcomers, they will have a little precedence over others. I'll try to see as many as I can from that list. <laughs>